Hi, I'm Allison, owner of Philadelphia-based vintage synthesizer service and restoration workshop, Beltone Synthworks. And today I'm going to be explaining how the panel, memory, and preset sound selection works in the Yamaha CS80. This is the first in a what will hopefully be a series of videos I'm planning to make that are inspired by the circuit descriptions in synthesizer service manuals. One of the things that's been really helpful to me in my tech work and in coming to be able to connect my general knowledge of electronics theory with how synthesizers are designed specifically has been reading those circuit descriptions. A lot of the small American companies especially wrote really great detailed step-by-step -step explanations of how their instruments worked. So I thought I would do the same for some circuits that uh, catch my eye as I work for being clever, stupid, <laughs> smart, silly, weird, anything, um, and focus on synth circuits that don't have good documentation. So I thought the Yamaha CS80 was a good target for this because its, its service manual is especially difficult to work with. It doesn't have any circuit descriptions for anything other than the proprietary Yamaha syntheses. And throughout the labeling of signals, connections, and circuit blocks is really poor in a way that really slows you down as you try to familiarize yourself with it. So how does the switching of sounds work in the CS80? Well, the basic premise is to enable or disable each entire bank of slide potentiometers for the panel and the two memory selections and each entire set of fixed resistor voltage dividers that create the control voltages for the preset selections by removing or applying a supply voltage to them depending on which is selected. So it starts up here with what Yamaha calls the tone selector, which is this array of 28 momentary button switches, which are used to choose between the 14 possible sounds for each of the two channels, upper and lower. 11 presets, the main panel settings on these sliders, and two additional banks of sliders for each channel, hidden under here, which Yamaha calls memory. I think memory is a pretty big overstatement of what's going on here because these are just normal sliders and the extent to which they remember where they're, where they're set is just due to the fact that they're inanimate objects that can't move by themselves. The button switches control 14 proprietary Yamaha switching ICs called IG00157s that now sell for about $80 each. I wasn't able to find schematics for them online, but it wasn't difficult to deduce exactly what's in it and how it works. So what's going on inside the IG00157 is that each button controls a single clocked D flip-flop with two D flip-flops inside each Yamaha 157 chip. A D flip-flop is an important type of basic logic block that will read a logic value in the form of a higher low voltage at its data input and latch or hold that level at its output, typically identified as Q, whenever it receives a high voltage on what is called its clock input. They also typically have a complementary output expressed as Q with a line over it called not Q, which is always the opposite of whatever the main output Q is. The source of the data input in this application is the momentary switch which connects to the 15 volt supply via resistor as seen in Yamaha's schematic. Within the IC, the data input is internally connected to the clock input with the clock inputs of all 14 flip-flops on seven ICs per channel bus together here on their ends. So whenever a button is pressed, just that flip-flops data input goes high the high voltage is also sent to all of the clocks, causing all of them to simultaneously check their data inputs and latch whatever it is on their data input to their output. Only the one whose button was just pressed will have its output Q latch high, and all of the others will latch low. The diode between each data input and the clock bus prevents all of the other data inputs from being pulled high whenever the clock goes high. 
Meanwhile, the complementary not Q output is used to turn the lamp on and off, presumably with a transistor added to supply enough current to it. With one lead of the lamp connected to 15 volts at all times, the lamp will only turn on when the other lead is at a low voltage. So the output of the tone selector is 28 individual logic levels, each one of them representing the state of one of the 14 possible tone selections in each of the Sense2 channels. These signals are then sent to this circuit board called BA board, where they are applied to the basis of 28 individual transistors, 14 for the 14 sounds in each channel once again. One of these for each channel will turn on, corresponding to which button has been most recently pressed in that channel. The turn on transistor will output 10 volts and all others will output 0 volts and send them on to the next stage. The outputs of the BA board coming from the emitters of these transistors become the supply voltage buses for all of the parameter control voltages. So here's a closer look at the full CV generation path for channel 1. The 14 possible supply voltage lines for the 14 sounds come from the BA board and go to five places. Six of them goes to this board T51 to be distributed to fixed resistor voltage dividers for the first six presets, each consisting of the resistors the buses connect to directly, plus the 10k ohm resistor drawn right at the CV output on the schematic. Five of them go to T52 to be distributed to similar voltage dividers for the remaining five presets. One of them goes to the wire bus that supplies all of the main panel sliders, and the last two go to each of the two banks of memory sliders for that channel. The outputs of the panel sliders come in on the T51 wires, and each run through a diode here before being dumped onto the respective CV mixing buses along with the outputs of the first six presets voltage dividers. For a few specific parameters, the outputs of both the main panel and memory bank sliders are sent to the BA board first and run through op amp buffers before being sent to the T boards. Then the 26 CVs on the T51 board are daisy chained to the T52 board where they meet up with the voltages from the other five presets and from the same point are sent to the CV input points on the first voice board. Isn't something missing though? When do the rest of the memory bank sliders have the opportunity to dump their CVs in? Okay, well, after all of the CVs on each of the eight voice boards are daisy chained together, you'll notice that even on the last board, voice eight, there are two wires for each CV. This is where the memory CVs are being dumped in, and the memory sliders have their diodes just soldered directly to the back of them to avoid having to put them somewhere else. So what we have here is a system that's basically very simple, but also very messy and very precarious. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, and the failure of even just one tiny component can make a lot of things not work correctly. For example, if you have just one shorted transistor on the BA board, the corresponding sound's supply voltage bus will always be on, meaning that the CVs from it will always be added to whatever CVs are actually selected, and every single sound, except for that one, will sound wrong. On the flip side, if one of the diodes connecting a specific slider to the CV bus fails as a short, whenever that slider is set to a low voltage, it will pull that entire bus down and hold it there no matter what sound is selected. And finally, you can get some really weird symptoms arising from the fact that not every parameter is used in every preset. Um, for example, this CS80 had a problem where the 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th preset of channel 2 didn't produce any sound at all. And I also noticed by looking at it on the scope that the supply rail, uh, supply buses for those CVs for those presets never went high when they were selected. Um, the, first, the first thing that could point to this would be a problem either in the switching or um, on the tone selector or on the BA board, but by disconnecting the output of the BA board for those I was able to confirm that the switching was indeed working correctly, which meant that the problem must be something further down the line. 
Looking at the schematics a bit more, I discovered that those four presets had one thing in common, and that was that they were the only presets in which the input voltage was being sent to the CV bus identified as 4, which is the oscillator pulse wave on and off setting. This is a binary parameter, meaning that it can only be on or off, and these were the only presets that had it turned on. And sure enough, if I turn pulse wave on while the panel or a memory was selected, that slider bank's entire supply bus would get pulled down too. So then I knew it must be something connected to that, and I eventually traced the problem to this transistor, TR7, on one of the voice boards having failed. So whenever the CV supply voltage was applied to this CV bus, as it was in those presets only, the entire supply would short through TR7 of that voice to a very low voltage. So my main takeaway from familiarizing myself with this system is that it's a very simple primitive system that Yamaha really stretched to its limits, and the entire CS80 is designed that way. I'm making another video about the CS80 where I describe what goes into restoring one, but also talk about the design ethos behind it and how it was simultaneously the apex and the death gasp of a certain synth design paradigm. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can check it out on our channel as well. Um, and please subscribe if you're interested in seeing more synth restoration videos, um, circuit description videos like this, and other stuff where we just goof around on synths. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram at Beltone Synthworks. Uh, visit our website at beltonesynthworks.com and email us at the email address in the description if you have a vintage synthesizer you're interested in having us restore. Thanks so much!